In August 1943, the Solomon Islands campaign was at its brutal peak, and American Corsair pilots faced a harrowing reality. Their F-4U Corsairs, advertised as the fastest fighters in the Pacific at 417 miles per hour, were routinely being outpaced by the Japanese Zeros during actual combat. On paper, the Corsair was supposed to dominate. Its 2,000-horsepower Pratt and Whitney R-2800 double wasp engine, inverted gullwing design, and meticulously engineered airframe promised unrivaled performance, and test pilots in Stratford, Connecticut, lauded it as a marvel of aeronautical engineering, but above the tangled jungles and harbors of New Georgia and Munda, where air combat was fought between 10,000 and 15,000 feet, Pilots discovered a cruel truth. The lightweight, highly maneuverable Zeros could accelerate away from the Corsairs in level flight at precisely the moments when American pilots needed speed the most. Major Robert Owens of VMF-215 documented the phenomenon after a disastrous engagement on August 7th over Renova Harbor. Twelve Zeros against his squadron. Corsairs diving from superior altitude energy and tactics in their favor, yet unable to maintain pursuit when the Japanese fighters leveled off. Three Corsairs returned damaged. One was lost, and Owens could only note bitterly, We should have caught them. The aircraft manual says we're faster, but we're not faster where it counts. Squadron after squadron reported similar experiences and American intelligence, upon examining captured Zeros, found no secret modifications. These underpowered, lightly armored Japanese fighters, using only 1,130 horsepower, were simply exploiting the physics of the denser air at combat altitudes, turning a theoretical advantage on paper into a deadly vulnerability for American pilots. Between June and August 1943, Marine Corsair squadrons posted barely positive kill ratios, 1.3 enemy aircraft destroyed for every Corsair lost. A far cry from the dominance promised by the Navy, confidence among pilots eroded, some even requesting transfers back to the slower but more predictable F-4F Wildcats. It was in this crisis that Staff Sergeant Jim Lefferts, a 31-year-old crew chief from Tarut, Indiana, recognized the problem. A farm kid turned marine maintenance expert, Lefferts had washed out of flight school due to depth perception issues, but had developed an uncanny ability to understand mechanical systems. By 1943, he had logged 4,200 maintenance hours on radial engines, keeping Corsairs flying when parts were scarce and logistics precarious. He noticed something subtle but critical. Returning Corsairs at 15,000 feet were running cooler than expected, signaling that while the engine had power, it wasn't being efficiently converted into thrust through careful logging of airspeed, engine RPM, and manifold pressure readings, Lefferts discerned a clear pattern. At combat altitude, Corsairs were losing 35 to 45 miles per hour of potential speed. And the culprit was the propeller. Hamilton Standard's three-bladed, 13-foot, four-inch propeller had been optimized for 25,000 feet, assuming future air battles would occur at high altitudes against European-style bomber formations. Its 47.5-degree blade pitch, perfect for thin air, was choking in the denser Pacific air at 10,000 to 15,000 feet, like a car stuck in the wrong gear unable to transfer engine power to forward motion. Regulations forbade field modifications. The propellers were government property, factory set to precise tolerances, and unauthorized changes could result in court-martial, dishonorable discharge, or even manslaughter charges if a modification caused a crash. But Lefferts, having attended seven memorial services for pilots whose Corsairs were correct on paper but hopeless in reality, decided the risk was worth it. Over two nights, using a slide rule, Hamilton Standard Engineering specifications and basic physics, 
He recalculated the optimal blade pitch for the dense combat air, determining that a reduction of just 2.5 degrees from 47.5 degrees to 45 degrees at the effective radius would allow the propeller to bite efficiently into the thicker air, converting engine power into thrust and recovering the lost 40 miles per hour. Under the cover of darkness on August 12, 1943, Lefferts and two trusted mechanics, Corporal Eddie Brinks and Private First Class Tommy Hang, set to work on Aircraft 17, assigned to First Lieutenant Bob McClure, a pilot who had narrowly survived multiple engagements where Zeros had simply outrun him. They jacked the Corsair's tail, removed the 130-pound propeller, and carefully heated each blade's route to 400 degrees Fahrenheit, just enough to make the aluminum malleable but avoid weakening its structure. Using a 30-foot pipe wrench, they twisted each blade with painstaking precision, monitoring displacement with a makeshift measuring jig and painstaking calculations until the three blades had been successfully repitched to 45 degrees. By 0340 hours, Aircraft 17's propeller was complete, looking factory new but aerodynamically transformed. The next morning, Major Greg Boyington, unaware he was testing a modified propeller, taxied and took off for a routine patrol. At 15,000 feet, pushing the throttle to the firewall, the air's speed needle climbed past expected limits, settling at 412 miles per hour, an unprecedented gain of 40 miles per hour. Boyington repeated the tests in shallow climbs, dives, and level flight consistently verifying the improvement. Upon landing, he immediately sought out Lefferts and demanded the modification be applied to every Corsair in the squadron. By August 18th, all 18 operational aircraft in VMF-214 had received the modification, and the combat results were immediate. On August 19th, eight Corsairs intercepted 15 Zeros escorting bombers, and in an engagement lasting just 11 minutes, VMF-214 claimed seven confirmed kills with no significant damage to their own aircraft. Pilots described the experience as revolutionary. For the first time, they could dictate engagement terms, deciding when to fight and when to disengage, leveraging the Corsair's superior speed to exploit Zeros' weaknesses rather than being constrained by physics. The unauthorized modifications spread rapidly. Other squadrons, intrigued and desperate to regain an edge, visited Munda Airfield to observe, learn, and replicate Leffert's technique, often without formal permission. By September, kill ratios across modified Corsair squadrons had skyrocketed from 1.3 to 1 to over 11 to 1. When the Navy Bureau of Aeronautics discovered the field modifications, a formal investigation was launched, threatening court-martial for Lefferts, Boyington, and Major Bailey. The initial assessment labeled the changes as criminal negligence and reckless endangerment. But the combat data, pilot testimony, and independent engineering review told a different story. The propellers were structurally sound, the modifications dramatically improved performance, and the risks had been expertly managed. By October 1943, the Navy quietly acknowledged the specifications were wrong for combat altitude, and in November, formal technical orders were issued, standardizing Leffert's 45-degree pitch across all F-4U-1 and F-4U-1A Corsair's retrofits proceeded immediately and by early 1944, thousands of Corsairs were combat-optimized with improved thrust and speed, fundamentally changing air tactics in the Pacific. The modification allowed pilots to engage on their terms, extended their survivability, and directly contributed to the Corsair becoming the dominant carrier-based fighter in the theater, ultimately achieving kill ratios of 14 to 1 by the end of the war. Lefferts, who never received an official medal, continued his work training mechanics, 
and his innovation became a case study in adaptive field engineering, influencing procedures through Korea and beyond. By bending propeller blades 2.5 degrees at a time, Jim Lefferts didn't just fix a plane, he reshaped the Pacific Air War, proving that the people closest to the problem can sometimes out-engineer entire bureaus of experts, and that innovation under pressure can change the course of history.